Hi and welcome. I'm the Reverend Dr. Cheryl Gaver, Presbyterian Minister of Three Congregations in Eastern Ontario, and thank you for joining us for this week's Bible study. We are stopping our study on Revelation until the fall. We finished last week with Revelation chapter 11. And this week, in our last Bible study before summer break, we're looking at Bible translations. So how do we know which one is the best? We're going to be exploring the difference between uh, translations, versions, other types of Bibles. We're going to look at what are we looking for, what do we mean by best. And then for those who love the King James Version, why, what's wrong with the King James Version or why we don't recommend it. So stay tuned and I will put on the slides. Just a minute. So those are our three topics. So now before we start, some very basic facts. The Bible was not written in English. Jesus did not speak King James English. So the King James Bible is not the original Bible. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic. It's written over a span of a thousand years and the Aramaic, yes, that's the language that Jesus spoke, but the New Testament is actually written in Koine Greek. So if you're talking about the original manuscript, uh, we've got two different manuscripts, one sort of the official Old Testament, and the other is the official New Testament. And uh, there may be many contenders for this. What is the original? What is the authoritative? Uh, that's a good question. Okay, so yes, whenever we're talking about uh, Bibles today or reading Bibles in English, we are in fact talking about a translation. But we rate some of the different translations. So one of the things is, is it done by one person? And that we tend to call a translation. It's done by one person. Now, maybe there's a committee in the background, but it's one person's name that's a, associated with it. And if it's done by one person, you're relying on his or her knowledge of the original language. So if they're a Greek expert, how well do they know Hebrew? If they're a Hebrew expert, how well do they know Greek? So very few of these translations are of the whole Bible. So Barclay, uh, trans if you've ever read William Barclay's commentaries, he always has a translation at the beginning and he will talk in depth about the, the words and, and the nuances and their meanings and their historical context. Another popular translation is J.B. Phillips' translation of the New Testament. It's a little dated now, but uh, at least what I've read it, I'm like, uh-huh, it's not quite modern English, but it's a very good translation. Neither Phillips nor Barclay ever touched the Old Testament uh, in their published books. You may be familiar with the message, and it's done by Eugene Peterson, who seems to have, been, to have good knowledge, perhaps in-depth knowledge of both Hebrew and Greek. What was his specialty? That may be another question. A version is a translation that's done by a group. So you might have uh, Hebrew scholars here and Greek scholars there, and they're working on the different parts. They'll come together. You may have a group of Greek scholars. And so if one gets it slightly off, the others are there to correct, they can bounce ideas. Here's this word, this is what it means. Is it the same in the Old Testament, New Testament? Are they talking? Is there a prophecy? Are they foreshadowing each other? So you're getting discussions about problematic words. Uh, you might be getting some a good translation. Yes, it's absolutely right, but who, who on earth speaks that way? So you, you've got uh, what's generally considered a higher quality. So versions are at the top, translations are underneath because they are the product of one person. Then we have a whole other group of Bibles and these are not uh, 
I, I would say they're not necessarily reputable Bibles, but they're not disreputable either. It's, their purpose is different. So if you have an interlinear Bible, for example, you'll have a line of Hebrew and then the English or a line of Greek and then the English. As we've got one per one, you see exactly what's going on. That's really great when you're studying it, but it probably doesn't make good sense in English because it's following the Hebrew or Greek uh, rules of grammar or sentence structure. If you have a picture Bible or a children's Bible, it's not trying to be, you know, a mastermind, a masterful translation. It's trying to tell the story in a way that pe this audience can understand. And they do it very, very well. They are teasers. They're there to grab your attention, grab your interest, so that in time you'll want to read the fuller account. You might have uh, abridged Bibles or an, uh, um, paraphrases. And again, these are there to get you into the topic, get you wanting to learn more, piquing your interest, your curiosity. You have annotated Bibles and study Bibles. Well, actually, if you opened it and you would look, it would tell you most likely that it is this translation or that version. So the text itself is of an already recognized translation or version, but the notes, which is what's famous for the annotated or study Bible, is what they have focused on. So they're saying, here's our text, and we're using this text to base all our comments and studies upon. And so, yes, they're very good. Uh, and some are better than the others, and they may reflect different theologies and things like that. But if you look again, what is the translation of the Bible they're using? It's either a version or a translation. They're not doing it themselves. They're not going back to scratch. They're not like reinventing the wheel. They're going to focus on how to study the word. Okay, so that takes care of the first question. The second one was, we want the best translation. What do we mean by best? So put the video on pause and think for a moment. What do you mean? What are you looking for when you say the best translation? And when you're ready, come back. So one of the things is accurate. We want the most accurate. The one, the one that really captures the essence of the original text. Well, there's ways, several ways we can do this. One is word for word, such as in the interlinear. Hmm. But that may make it harder for us to actually understand. <clears throat> we might go idiom for idiom, which is a little bit better than word for word. And we might talk about understanding as originally understood or a dynamic equivalence, as uh, one person wrote it, uh, or titled it, and um, thought by thought, so any of those things. We're trying to capture that essence. The other thing is, who's the audience? I've already hinted at that. If it's for children, you'll want something that's easy for them to understand. If it's uh, for a student, Studying Hebrew and Greek, you may want a different one because you want something really close word for word. If it's for a study Bible study group, you may want something more in the middle. So someone who's highly educated, who may not be as educated. So you've got different categories that way. And also, what is that purpose? So here's some, some information, and we're going to talk about accurate. Now, according to Bible Gateway, there are two main approaches, the word for word or thought for thought. That's word for word or dynamic equivalency. And so they rate the different translations that you can find on their website according to those criteria. So the interlinear is, you know, as basic as you can get. You're going to see, you know, what each Greek or Hebrew word means and English equivalent. 
but it's not going to be in English sentence form. Then you have the RSV, Revised Standard, King James Version, very close to the original. You can take those texts, look at the original, and you can almost match, okay? The new RSV, the new King James is here. So it's all here. In the dynamic side, where you almost want to do a paraphrase, uh, you'll end up with the message, the living, the Good News Bible, those are the three that I like. <clears throat> and they aren't paraphrases, but they are translating um, the essence of what's being said. And we'll see that a bit later. Then in the middle, you've got Bibles that are trying to find a balance in between the two. And that is the most famous right now is the New International Version. So there it gives you that continuum. Which is the best? This can be very accurate word for word, and this can be very accurate idea by idea. Um, so it's really hard to say. It's what you're looking for. Now, to give you some examples, le bureau des affaires étranges, okay? So if I go to a dictionary and you know, just Google it, and I will see le is the, de is of. So bureau is desk or office, um, and affaire is, is, um, affaire is a businessman. So affaire is business, étrange is strange, and it could also be foreign. So I can translate it word for word, literally, as the desk of strange business. And if you try to say that in Canada, uh, people would look at you very strangely because that's not what this means. All right, I could go the desk of foreign business. Um, okay, or the office of foreign business people would still find it hard to direct you to the right department in the government if, the, if you, that's how you translated it. In French, it's le bureau des affaires étranges. In English, in Canada, it's the Department of External Affairs. So external is outside of Canada. In the States, the accurate translation of this is the State Department. So it's like, what? Okay, bureau and department, I can get that, but affaire doesn't mean state. Well, yes, it does, because if you're talking about this department and government, the American equivalent is the State Department. And there you see this, the problem of translation. Word for word, you can be very accurate, but what it was, was a department in the government and the English equivalent is this in Canada and that in America. So it, it's a really good way of figuring, of seeing what the problem is. When you get into Hebrew, the first word is ben Adam, son of man, bar Adam in Aramaic. But and so you see this phrase in the Old Testament and you go, oh my God, it's a messianic prophecy. It's referring to Jesus. Uh, no, not always, because actually it's a phrase that means human being. Hmm. You know, part of a human being. Not son of man, Messiah at all. To get a, maybe a better sense of this, in his uh, series on Narnia, C.S. Lewis refers to um, the, the heroes as sons of Adam or daughters of Eve. It, it's a way of saying a human being. And so you'll have translations um, that will recognize this and that they may not say human being. Uh, I believe some will say, when they're talking about Ezekiel chapter 37, you'll see it might say mortal man. 
it's sort of a, a way of trying to capture the poetry inherent in the Hebrew. So mortal man do this. Other translations will have son of man and some will capitalize, some won't. We know what the original says. We know what it means. The problem is what does it signify? Is it referring to human beings or is it becoming this title, the messianic title? Because we see that transition. Remember, the Hebrew Old Testament is written over a thousand years. So we get to see some of the developments of an ordinary phrase here may suddenly seem more like a title over here. There's been a shift in development. And so we're starting to get into these arguments over the word and its meaning in the original context. How do we translate that into English? Ha'il is a different character. It's one where the word is very clear, the meaning is very clear, but because of our own biases, we cannot accept what it says, and so we change it. So the word occurs in Hebrew in the Old Testament. I can't remember now if it's 42 times or 142 times. I think it's 142 times. It refers generally to man or God. So males or God. And it's always translated as powerful, v valorous, uh, or valiant, you know, brave, courageous, strong, powerful. Four times it refers to women. And it's translated as virtuous, good, capable, why? The Hebrew doesn't distinguish. It's basically saying a powerful woman or a strong woman. But because we in our society have trouble imagining women as being strong or valiant or powerful, we will say, well, for a woman to be, you know, strong. She has to be multitasking, you know, perfect mother, perfect this. She has to be keeping everything tidy. She has to be there for her children, for her. Uh-uh. Hebrew doesn't say that. Hebrew just says it's strong. She's powerful. And I can say she does a lot of things, but that's not the source of her power. That's what her power enables her to do. So where is the bias coming in? out. <sighs> There's other things too. So here's Proverbs 31 verse 10, just to show you how this ranges. King James Version, who can find a virtuous woman, NRSV, a capable wife, NIV, noble character, good news, capable wife, living Bible, truly good wife, message a good woman's hard to find they cannot bring themselves to say a powerful woman or a powerful wife capable is at least a little more active more dynamic than noble good or virtuous so maybe Here's another chart to show you that, that range of word to word and free dynamic thought by thought. And we have here, as, as, we might, as we've said before, the King James, New King James revised um, version. The revised standard though, is just a little bit towards the middle. On the free side, the new living, good news, Jerusalem, New English, New Jerusalem. I have trouble with the New English because to me it seems really formal. So I would put it over here, but I would have to get into it a bit more. Part of me thinking, wait a second, it's British English as opposed to American English. Is that one of the problems? I don't know. In the middle, we've got here the New International, New American, New Revised Standard. They're trying to balance 
you know, and this is why I like the image because everything is trying to balance accuracy in terms of word, accuracy in terms of understanding and you're trying to balance. This is a chart about the different grade levels. You can take the translations and sort of group, group them by grade. So the message is like for grade four, grade five. So if you wanna give your, your youth or your children in Sunday school a Bible, the message is a really good Bible to give them. Uh, if they're below, if they're too young for that, they can grow into it, uh, but it's, it's pretty good. The NIV, is for grade seven to eight. So, you know, depending on how well people read, and reading is one of those skills we seem to be losing, um, this will affect which Bible to buy. The King James and RSV really require grade 12 or higher education. And I'll come to that discussion when we talk about the King James. New King James, they must have simplified it to make it easier to understand. Okay, so our last question is, what's wrong with the King James Version? Well, there's two main things. The one doesn't really come into a discussion unless you really want to get to the original uh, text. So, and that's our, excuse me, that's archaeology. The King James Bible Version was published in 16th, 11th, so in the 17th century. The text that was used to translate everything was the Vaticanus text. So that's from the fourth century, 300, about 300 years after Jesus died. That's good. And that's our earliest copy of the whole New Testament. But is it, can we get closer and earlier? Well, no, not in 1611. But in the 19, 19th century, 20th century, so in the 1800s, 1900s, was like a, a, an outpouring of archaeological discoveries. We found another complete New Testament, the Sinaiticus, that may be a bit earlier than the Vaticanus, it, but it also seems to be from the fourth century. But we have manuscripts going back uh, to uh, 30, no, I'm not sure that early, but up 60 years after Jesus died. So wouldn't those, shouldn't those inform us or, or influence how we translate or how we study the New Testament? And that's why I said it, it's taking us, what is the original text? And we have the Bible Society working on a new complete uh, New Testament. It's based on the Kurt Allen, uh, this work on the manuscripts, and they're evaluating the different manuscripts. And this seems to be the original based on these sources. And that seems to be the original based on those. And now rate them A, B, C, D, you know. And um, you're like, like what? What? <laughs> I'm not sure. And um, that's great if you want to go into that kind of detail. Otherwise, you take the, the Texas Receptus, the Vaticanus, whatever, and, and you say, that's my text. We know it's from 300 years later, but that's fine. Okay, so that's one category and why some of the newer translations can differ so much from the King James, because they may be using some of these others. The biggest problem with the King James is language. It's published in 1611, 400 years ago, over 400 years ago. Do you know what? English has changed a lot since then. If you understand Shakespeare, you will understand the King James Version. If you struggle to make any kind of sense out of Shakespeare, stay away from the King James because you'll struggle even more. Okay, so words have changed meanings. Verb forms have changed. And you could take some, uh, if, if you just think, he maketh me to lie down. And you go, what? He makes me. Uh, the passive, it is written, Paul writes. 
you have that thing. We don't like the passive form anymore. We want the active form. Biggest thing, short sentences. King James English, they had long sentences. They're declaiming, uh, they're proclaiming truths and it goes on and on and on. And you have uh, coordinate clauses, subordinate clauses, that direct objects, indirect objects, subordinate clauses, modifying indirect objects. Okay, if you're confused, that's what you've got in 1611. 21st century, tw late 20th century, we don't like long sentences. We want short sentences, short, active, to the point. So that's one of the big differences. So what's happening is, yes, the King James Version is very accurate, but we almost need another translation from the King James to modern English because it's changed so much. I call attention to the word thou and thine because this is where the word has changed meanings a bit or implication. So in our prayer, our Father who art in heaven, notice this, who art, instead of who is. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy. It sounds rather regal, doesn't it? Formal. Your majesty. Thy grace. Thy pres you honor us with thy presence or something like that. It's very formal. Well, yes, but in the 1600s, that was exactly the opposite. You, ye, that was formal or plural. Thou, thy, thine, that was the second person singular. In French, we would say it's tutoyer. You're, you're, tu. you're using tu with reference to God. In German, it's the du instead of z. It's du, du gist. In English, it'd be basically saying, our Father who's in heaven, or our Heavenly Father, I'll be your name. Buddy, Queenie, have your kingdom here. Queenie, Buddy, pal. That's the, the, the nuance for thou and thine. But today, it's exactly the opposite. And so when you have a lot of that happening, you need not just to put in modern English, but to also show where the old English is leading us astray because we've changed the meaning over time. So that's some of the problems with the King James Version. If you can handle them, great. It's a beautiful translation. It's poetic. It's powerful. It's gutsy. But it's harder for many people to understand because it is basically Shakespearean English. So just sort of to wrap it up, I wanted to show you some of the translations of and the problems based on Psalm 23 uh, verses 1 and the beginning of 2. So King James, many of us have learned it in the King James, a revised standard. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down, or he makes me lie down. So that's sort of very close. The problem is, for me today, when I read this and when I hear it, I'm, my first reaction is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But no, I do want you, God. Because to me, I, I say, the Lord's my shepherd that I don't want. And that's not what the original means. I don't want you, God. Hmm. The NIV recognizes that, that I shall not want has shifted. We don't make that automatic connection anymore. So they change it. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. That's that dynamic thought. That's the translating thought for thought. I shall not want means I don't, I have everything I need. I, I lack nothing. And so we have that in the good news. I have everything I need. He makes me lie down. That sounds like he's going to 
push me down to the ground. The good news says, no, he lets me rest is probably better. So you can see where they're making some adjust adjustments. The Living Bible goes a bit further to make one connection clearer. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. He lets me rest. The message I'm going to come back to, the Jerusalem Bible, which is not on, on Bible Gateway, but I like it, Yahweh's my shepherd. So you see here, the Lord is all uh, uppercase. That's because it really is the name of God in the Hebrew. But whenever Jews see the name of God, they will say Lord instead. So what you'll often have is the consonants for the name of God and the vowels for Lord. When you put the two together, you end up with Jehovah. Another, another point, uh, lecture. But we think the name of God is Yahweh. So the Jerusalem Bible said, okay, it says Yahweh. Let's just put Yahweh there, even though every Jew would have read the Lord. I lack nothing. And the interesting thing with Jerusalem is they, they got that translation, he lets me lie. And they're trying to say, but this is poetry in the Hebrew. Can we make it into some kind of poetry in English? And they, they do, I think, a very good job. So what they did instead of, he makes me lie down in pastures green, it's in meadows of green grass, he lets me lie. So that you've got some kind of that, that balance. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six. So you see that parallelism? Six and four in the line one, six and four in line two, and automatically you've got this poetry. The message changes it quite a bit. So God, my shepherd, okay, I don't need a thing. You've bedded me down. Now, bedded me down sounds like something you do to a horse. So I really don't like that phrase. But the biggest problem is they've missed a transition that's in the Hebrew. And for me, when I do funeral services, I build on that transition. And I can't use the message because it won't let me build on it. And so let me show you what I mean. The Lord, my shepherd, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me this. He restores my soul. He does all sorts of things. Everything I know about God, everything I've learned about God over the years, from Sunday school, from sermons, from Bible studies, I have all this information about God, and I believe in him absolutely. But when I go through a crisis, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. When I go through the crisis, when something knocks me off my feet, what do I discover? I discover God right there, right beside me, picking me up and holding me. He's no longer this information I've learned about in school. He's now someone real who is right with me in my pain. And that transition from objective learning, learning about God, believing about God and believing in God, to now being knowing God, encountering God, is really, really powerful. And when you read the Psalms, you will often see that break. So even Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it's all these things where you feel abandoned by God and suddenly you've got that transition and you have God's presence and it's, it's powerful. Here, you don't have a transition. You're right up there with God. Hey God, you, right from verse two, verse one. God, my shepherd, I'm talking to you, God. And so you miss the chance to encounter God. So yeah. Don't like that one. Okay, so now that you've heard everything, can you decide which translation is best? It's the one you understand. It's the one that makes sense to you. It's the one that comes alive for you. The one that makes you want to read more. That's the translation that's best for you.
If you want to try some more passages, here's something I gave for homework for the people in our study group, is look up some of these passages in different translations. See which ones you like. Don't be afraid at mix and matching. So for Psalm 23, I'm probably going to stay with the NRSV. For Psalm 139, I'm going to stay with the Jerusalem Bible. For some of the others, I may stay with the Good News or the NIV. It, it depends which ones speak to me at those things. So that's it for today. And thank you for joining me. So once again, I'm the Reverend Dr. Cheryl Gaver, and thanks for joining us. This is our last Bible study until the fall. So we'll be back. Uh, we've got some sessions already scoped. We're going to do a couple of weeks on the time frame of the Bible. So one week on the Old Testament, one week on the New. So how it came to be, just very, very briefly. And then we're going to do a, a one week anyway on angels. And then we're going to get back into Revelation and keep going. So thank you. Take care. Have a great summer. And see you in the fall. Bye-bye.